The MCU shows have always been a playground for creators to take bolder, riskier swings into different genres and widen their appeal. We've gotten everything from Twilight Zone style sitcoms, psychological fantasy dramas, and Ally McBeal, but green. <laughs> And now Nick Fury gets the spotlight in a James Bond, Cold War inspired espionage thriller. But does this brave swing reshape the world of the MCU or even just Nick Fury himself? Or does the concept outshine the execution? My name is Ren and this is my rewrite to fix Marvel's Secret Invasion. Welcome back MCU fans, the Secret Invasion season finale hit Disney Plus this week and, and boy, boy do I, do I have, have some thoughts. thoughts. So many thoughts, I didn't just want to give you a traditional review, so I set up a challenge to myself to rewrite and try to fix the many issues me and unanimously the internet has with this show. However, out of the many complaints I've seen about Secret Invasion, no one has raised my biggest issue with this show. And that is, despite its great concepts, great ideas, great beats, there's never a sense of escalation. And that is the issue that plagued the entirety of Secret Invasion. There are things to actually love in this show, but actually think about it. When it comes to Gravik, when it comes to Gaia, when it comes to Talos, when it comes to pretty much any character besides Nick Fury, name me one beat that changed the direction their character was gonna go. There was never any doubt in my mind from the beginning of this show, Gravik would want to kill Talos. And he did. There wasn't a doubt in my mind that Gravik would amass the Super Scroll powers and become the Super Scroll. And he did. And that applies, like I said, to all the characters except Nick Fury, but the story in general itself. What's worse is that this season ends by teasing us an actual story of Secret Invasion. This show had a potential to overcome the comic book storyline. Don't get me wrong, I like the comic book run of Secret Invasion, but it's just a big battle between scrolls and heroes, and there's never nuance or intrigue to it all. This show started out with a ton of intrigue, especially surrounding Nick Fury. What they do with Nick Fury in this show, I loved. I found the characterization excellent, nuanced, and it allowed us a deeper dive into who Nick Fury is, showing all the shades of gray in this character. So in this rewrite, there are a couple of ground rules. I cannot change the show drastically from what it is. It has to begin and end in the same kind of resolutions, especially for the heart and soul of this show, Nick Fury himself. You will notice not a lot changes in my version in regards to his actions, motivations, and general characterization. The biggest changes in my version of Secret Invasion are to character dynamics surrounding Nick Fury and even the order of certain events. But what we do get here is just another version of the Secret Invasion we got on Disney Plus, not a completely different show. So, as I get started, get ready to start a conversation with your thoughts, with your changes to Secret Invasion. Criticize my changes all you want. You be the judge if this new version is better or not. Grab some popcorn as we embark on the most ambitious video in the history of the channel, starting with Secret Invasion, The Rand Cut, Episode 1. So my version of the premiere of Secret Invasion opens with the same sequence. Big Ross meeting a paranoid Ponsult, revealing he has uncovered a hidden Skrull invasion. Except after killing Ponsult, Fake Ross gets chased, not by Talos, but by Gravik wearing Nick Fury's face. This is important because Gravik ends up killing Fake Ross in a very public place. The square 
from the end of episode one. And while this is happening, Gravik himself was secretly chased by Talos, who sees all of this and knows this is not the real Nick Fury. We move on to real Nick Fury returning to Earth, and things play out essentially the same, except Gravik is part of Nick Fury's closely tight inner circle. So when Maria Hill takes Nick Fury to their secret hideout, not only is Talos there, Gravik is there as well. You cold-hearted son of a bitch, he yells at Fury before embracing him. Their dynamic in my version is one of father and son. Gravik looks up to Fury. He trusts him and has been his right-hand man on the scroll front, as we'll further learn as my version goes on. And has been his right-hand man on the scroll front, as we'll further learn. Fury is not the same man, but Talos is genuinely happy to see him, showing how the plant has acclimated to Earth like we see in the original Secret Invasion. This plot thread that went nowhere, also important in my version. And Gravik also notices this, seeing as Fury is not as actively suspicious or distrusting anymore. He is not considering every possibility. Fury wants to play it safe, but in my version, Maria Hill is distrustful of the Skrulls in general, not sharing Fury's affection for the race, creating immediate conflict between these two. This causes an argument with Gravik, who vouches for his people as wayward souls, lost, refugees. Hill argues they've outstayed their welcome now that they're taking over behind their backs. They're supposed to report to Fury and her not replace their allies without their knowledge. From here, we once more see Nick Fury investigating alone, willingly captured by Sonya, who is a much more hardcore version of my version of Maria Hill. She will kill, torture, and slaughter scrolls if need be, but still respects Fury enough to not stop him from trying to solve this mystery peacefully. Also in this version, Gravik follows Fury into Sonia's hideout and replaces one of her security guards. So not only does Fury bug her office, so does Gravik after Fury leaves. Not only that, even before getting to Sonia's office, Gravik bugged Fury himself and listens to their entire exchange. This shows us the effect Nick Fury has had on Gravik through his life. From here we go to New Skrullus and see Gaia is the leader of the Skrull Refuge with Gravik as her second in command. And the sequence in New Skrullus this time is played with much more warmth as it is genuinely a safe haven for Skrulls. Both Gravik and Gaia are adored by their fellow Skrulls and genuine leaders, concerned with their people playful with children, and they even have a small orchard sprouting all those flowers, but they're having problems in making them grow and thrive like Talos's private little flower that he showed to Fury. From here, Gaia receives a text and covertly meets with Talos on the forest right outside New Skrullus, who is keeping tabs on Chernobyl as he was the one who created the refuge after he brought a million scrolls to Earth while Nick was blipped and eventually went on to space and disappeared from Earth. It has been a year since Talos' wife soar and died, and the last person to see her alive was Gaia. But she does not remember this and promises she wasn't there. This raises Talos' suspicions, and he looks at Gravik from a distance with scorn as he plays around with the children, helps his fellow refugees and whatnot. And remember when I said fake Ross is killed in a public place for everyone to see wearing Nick Furious's face? Well, this has a natural effect, there's footage of it, and we see the US president with Rhodey in tow making his broadcast statement and outing the scrolls as a hidden menace among us, demanding action is taken. The statement we see at the end of the original Secret Invasion, well, in my version, that is what kicks off the conflict and the escalation in this show. This begins to create chaos around the world with murders on live TV, random people killing each other for suspecting each one is scrolls, just chaos all around, seemingly uncontrollable, where Nick Fury just sees the effect of his actions. This 
is a mess he created, and we need to make that clear, not only for the audience, but for the characters. Building up to the terrorist attack, which in my version happens in London, Brixton, which is the first place the Skrulls called home on Earth. Fury, Hill, Talos, Gravik, and Gaia attempt to stop this, but like in the show, there's a terrorist bombing, this time by an anti scroll radical group attempting to out scrolls posing as civilians. Because the show lost a lot of nuance where it made the scrolls actually good in Captain Marvel, but come the show, all the named scroll characters are just bad. And it lost a lot of nuance. In my show, there are good scrolls, there are bad scrolls all around. And it creates a sense of paranoia. Amidst the confusion and panic, Hill runs into Fury, who worries about this making the situation worse for the Skrulls. Angrily, Hill argues they're the cause of this. They're out of control. Fury looks at her shocked and disappointed and shoots Hill point blank in the chest, disappearing into the crowd. From here, the real Nick Fury finds Hill grounded in shock as he kneels next to her, attempting to stop the bleeding cut to black. We don't get the answer to who the Nick Fury who shot Maria Hill is. We know the answer, but we're intelligent enough to figure it out with the clues and seeds planted throughout the episode. So as you can see, it's pretty much the same episode, but there's a ton more conflict, there's a ton more paranoia, and there's a ton more escalation and setting up all the character dynamics, there's actual relationships developed and set up throughout this episode. So with that out of the way, let's move on to episode 2. My version of episode 2 begins with the same flashback as in the show, now giving Brixton and London in general more emotional significance in this story. The big difference here is we see a young Gravik being much more receptive to Fury. There's a gleam in the eyes of this young child seeing this total stranger vouch so much to keep him and his people safe, to find them a home, and seeing the adults of his species, his fellow refugees and war victims, having so much faith in this man and his mission statement. Because we need to see Gravik and Fury's relationship develop, seeing where it started and keep on evolving it through the show before all the twists and turns. We need to see who they were and who they've become to one another and not just be told about it. One of my favorite scenes from this episode is seeing Nick Fury in spy mode, initially disarming Talos with a personal story about him and his mom and turning it into an emotionally manipulative interrogation using their friendship as leverage, leaving Talos to feeling cornered, trapped, and with no way out with a tell me something I don't know game. So I'm keeping it, but I'm changing the resolution slightly. Talos confesses to Nick Fury he brought one million clandestine scrolls to Earth while Nick was blipped and went to space. And Talos takes Nick Fury to the hidden base we see at the end of Marvel's Secret Invasion, where we see countless people from all over have been replaced by these clandestine scrolls. This scene is essential, not just to happen this early on in the show, but to happen between these two characters. Secret Invasion is a show about Nick Fury and about Nick Fury's friendship with Talos. We need consequences for what Talos did behind Nick Fury's back, but also consequences for Nick Fury's inaction and his absence for so many years. We need consequences for Nick Fury having lost his groove. This moment is when Nick Fury decides to chastise Talos for his decision making, for betraying him, and so they part ways. Meanwhile, on New Skrullos, Gaia meets up with Gravik, who is behaving strangely, hiding something, and is also displaying the face of Kingsley Ben Adir, which Gaia finds obvious he choose that face. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in my version of Secret Invasion, whenever they're in their privacy, New Skrullos or just Nick Fury's inner circle, Gaia and Gravik are always in their scroll form. I don't like how Marvel Secret Invasion made these characters scroll and proud, but they're always in disguise. It doesn't make any sense to me, it pisses me off, and given they went with practical effects and makeup, Kingsley Benadir and Emilia Clarke can perfectly emote with these prosthetic on. So sorry for the diatribe, 
let's keep going. As Gravik manages to dismiss the conversation, Gaia eventually finds the machine being tested in the basement under his supervision. Gravik receives a communication that a scroll has been captured thanks to his bug on Sonia. As he leaves, Gaia steps into the lab and searches the database, finding strands of DNA of miscellaneous superpowered MCU characters as we see in the show. As she decides to step into the machine. We cut to Sonia torturing a scroll for information, but her interrogation is interrupted by Gaia, who bursts through the door, coming to the rescue. But unfortunately, arriving too late to save her fellow scroll. As she runs from the scene carrying the body, Gravik observes from a distance. Believing he lost Nick Fury's trust and this will eventually snowball into him losing his people's trust, Talos calls for a meeting with the scroll council and asks to be granted full power. Claiming he brought them here has kept them safe, given them peaceful, full lives and some powerful positions within our social-political sphere, but given his relationship with Fury now shaken, it will appease Nick Fury if Talos is in power. But the Skrull Council rejects this proposal. Meanwhile, Fury meets with Rhodey, who uses the footage of fake Fury killing Hill as leverage to ask him to step out of the way and allow the government to handle this invasion. Fury refuses to be fired, claiming, I'm Nick Fury. Even when I'm out, I'm in. Rhodey advises Fury to hide because soon enough, he will be suspect number one as a Skrull sympathizer and accused of bringing them all to Earth unauthorized. As Fury leaves, Rhodey makes a call to the president, advising him to keep eyes on Fury. It's not a matter of if, it is a matter of time. We cut to the Skrull Council meeting once more, this time summoned by Gravik, who claims he's more trustworthy not only to them, but to Fury himself. He knows Fury has failed them, but believes in his convictions to keep them safe and the humans at bay from them. The Skrull Council agrees, and Gravik is deemed Skrull General. Remember when this scene had absolutely no consequence in the show apart from giving Gravik some jets so he could travel fast from place to place? Don't worry, it will have consequences here. As Gravik leaves the meeting, he receives a call from Talos, who means to parlay. And as Talos turns off the call, we see he is with Gaia, who asks her father why Gravik is following her, given both Talos and Gravik are in Fury's inner circle. Talos doesn't know, but confesses he hasn't trusted Gravik in a long time. He saw him killing a scroll, posing as Ross, and pleads with Gaia to be careful around him, as one of her closest allies is a killer of their own kind. Gaia doesn't seem too concerned, but promises her father she is prepared should Gravik turn out to be as untrustworthy as Talos claims. From here, we see Nick Fury in this secret car from a secret garage, arriving home, putting on the ring, and meeting his wife, who turns out is a scroll. So in my episode two, we continue to develop relationships and raising intrigue as more and more characters begin to distrust each other. If you want your audience to have a sense of paranoia, let your characters have a sense of paranoia and don't spoon feed us the answers. So right now, if we were watching this version of the show, there would be a lot more suspicion on Talos himself. On to episode three. <music> episode three of a six episode series is the midpoint. It's when we need to see things escalate to a point where there's no coming back from, where characters' decisions up until now, need to start having payoff. And so, we open with a news broadcast with one of the members of the Scroll Council proposing not all scrolls are bad. We montage through articles, YouTube videos, news debates, protests, as we see the effect of the Scrolls' public presence on Earth, the POTUS' manifesto, and Gravik's plan as Scroll General. Scrolls are attacking in self-defense and even attacking to protect civilians, but some are even attacking unprovoked and we see radical groups on both sides, human and scroll. This is the montage we get at the end of Marvel's Secret Invasion. I am using it as the catalyst of everything that's been happening up until now on my version of the show, but also an effect of graphics rise to scroll general told you this would pay off and this is the beginning of his plan dissension and battles between scrolls and humans 
and you will see why in just a bit. The president sits, watching the rundown of all this offered by Rhodey, and advises a task force to work under Rhodey's command, dedicated to catching Fury. We cut to the flashback at the cafe with Fury and Vara, and eventually to their conversation over breakfast on the toll his life as a spy, as a man of secrets, has taken on their relationship. Fury asks directly if she knew about the scrolls Talos brought to Earth. Vara confesses she noticed a massive increase in scroll numbers, but couldn't wrap her head around it still hardly believing it could be Talos. Fury asks about Gravik, and she just laughs. That boy has done nothing but kept good on his word, even after you were gone. Any may not believe in you anymore, but he does, always has. Why do you think he chose the face he did? And remember what I said about payoff? Well, here it is. Fury has no reply to this. He just turns contemplatively to a picture of his mom, and his younger self, laid by Kingsley Ben Adir. Gravik shows the face of a young Nick Fury, not some random dude he killed under Fury's command. From here, Gravik meets with Talos in a cafe. The conversation is initially about fake Ross's death, but Gravik claims to have no knowledge. Soon enough, Talos interrogates him about the death of Sword, but Gravik simply shrugs and criticizes Talos for sending his wife and daughter on a mission alone. Provoked, Talos stabs Gravik in his hand. He whispers in Gravik's ear, I will prove what you did and show Fury you did not only betray your people, you betrayed him. Betrayed him? Gravik shouts back. I'm not the one who brought clandestine scrolls to Earth behind his back. Parasites occupying the place of innocent people. We were refugees, you made us war criminals. Who's the real traitor? As Talos gets up and walks off, Gravik's hand slides off the knife and regenerates. He is now a super scroll. From here we see Sonia sitting in her office as she speaks to Fury on the phone, placing the eye patch on the owl, believing Fury placed the bug. Fury asks if she's in her office, and when she says yes, he simply bursts through the door wanting to show her something. Fury takes Sonia to an alley and opens the back door of a van to reveal the dead body of the scroll Sonia killed in my version of episode 2. And as Sonia turns from the body to Fury, Fury turns into Gaia's natural scroll form with a gun pointed directly at Sonia's head. Why? Gaia asks. We can't take chances with you, can we? Sonia replies, chuckling. The real question is why haven't you pulled the trigger yet? Gaia lowers the gun and turns into her Emilia Clark form, asking Sonia for information on any scrolls she may have. You mean Gravik? Sonia immediately asks. Gaia is in shock. Sonia steps in closer and basically repeats her speech from the finale, suggesting a strictly professional relationship unlike that of her father and Furies where they mutually use each other. Finally, she simply advises Gaia to search for answers about her mother's death in New Skrullos. As Gaia and Sonia part ways, a motorcycle follows Gaia as she drives off on the van. We cut to Vara in her home, and Rhodey knocks at the door. She hesitates to let him in at first, but he has scars with his task force awaiting by the door. She lets him in, and they sit down to discuss Fury and his allegiances. Vara claims his business is his alone, but Rhodey quickly turns this conversation into an interrogation about her loyalty to her people. Vara claims she has never wavered, not even for her husband. Rhodey gets up and promises to put that to the test soon enough. As Gaia arrives back at New Skrullos, something hits her van and it rolls, making her crash on the road. As she drags herself from under the crashed van, Talos steps in to help her. What happened? He asks. Gaia pushes him off and points her gun at him. Cut the shit, Gravik. Gravik turns into his natural form. You couldn't leave it alone, could you? Killing your own people? This isn't what Fury would have wanted, Gaia shouts back. No, Gravik shouts. What he wouldn't have wanted is a bunch of ungrateful scrolls led by the doubts of your poisonous mother taking over this planet. Gaia is overwhelmed with shock, realizing Gravik killed her mother. Her hesitancy gives Gravik a chance so he shoots Gaia multiple times in the chest. He sheds a tear, looking at her grounded body and whispers to himself, or our home. In my version of Secret Invasion, this might have ended up being the shortest episode, not because I didn't change a lot, but I kept this episode just to the bare essentials. Every scene is lean and serves a purpose, and it elevates from where the characters were 
prior to this episode. This is a transitional episode in every way, but it is designed to be so. And if episode three was my shortest episode, episode four might end up being the longest episode in my version of Secret Invasion. But it begins in the same way we began the original episode four, opening with Gaia on the ground. As we flashback, like in the show, her wounds regenerate and she sits up, coming back to life. Only this time, Nick Fury steps out of the woods, having witnessed the whole thing and claiming he might not have come if not for Sonya reaching out to him directly. He now knows what Gravik has been doing. From here, we cut to the flashback in Paris 2012 with Vara. I'm keeping this scene because I find it crucial to the relationship of Vara and Nick Fury, but it also sheds a light on our understanding of Nick Fury, a morally complex, even shady character who always has someone to clean up his messes, whether it is Carol Danvers in Captain Marvel or the Avengers in the Avengers, except his wife always sees him as a person of devotion and integrity to protect the lives he promises to protect, whether those are human lives or scroll lives. It fleshes out their dynamic as a couple, but it also sheds light on Nick Fury's journey in this show, where he has to come to terms of cleaning up his own messes. That's why he doesn't call the Avengers, that's why he takes on this mission all by his lonesome, and that's why this mission, out of any other one, costs him the most. The next scene is Vara at home, as Fury bursts through the door with Gaia, asking her if she knew about Gravik. Vara claims she didn't. Tensions rise, and the same fake shootout scene plays out between the two as we saw in the actual show, ending with the same question and answer about if their love is real. But Vara warns Fury he should go into hiding. As Fury and Gaia step out of the house, Talos' car stops by the entrance. He is their escape route. Rhodey is listening in, having bugged Vara's phone, and commands his team to go into action. Fury. Fury, Talos, and Gaia go on the run with Rhodey's team chasing, with a small team holding and surveilling Vara in her home. As this is happening, the president broadcasts a new manifesto, revealing Fury to be a scroll sympathizer with the footage of fake Fury killing Maria Hill, asking for any information anyone might have on Fury and any accomplices, with pictures of Talos and Gaia shown with a wanted label. As this news breaks, scroll protesters assume their true forms and go out into the streets with posters and t-shirts and picket signs with the words, trust Nick Fury, which only aggravates the situation. Armed forces begin to emerge in cities around the planet to stop and arrest scroll protesters. This is the payoff for Gravik becoming scroll general, a spokesperson between scrolls and Nick Fury who incites his people to stand up for their quote unquote savior, a conviction he has held for 30 years and has taken him to the point that he will kill anyone that opposes Nick Fury, scroll or human. Meanwhile, Fury, Talos, and Gaia are on the run from Rhodey's team, and I want a big highway action set piece. This show, whether we're talking about the actual show we got or my version, is aesthetically, tonally, character-wise inspired by Winter Soldier. We have seen this through the narrative, and so I want the action itself to mirror that of Captain America the Winter Soldier. This is just a rewrite, so I'm not married to any ideas in regards to the direction or how long it takes. Gravik sees these events. Gravik sees the events unfolding on the news, and so dashes off to help them. Or so we think. We intercut between the action escalating in the highway, the chase scene, and the next time we see Gravik, he is at the hideout and finds Talos's flower, which is where Nick Fury hid the harvest with Captain Marvel's blood, which is in itself what allowed the flower to sprout and thrive. I found it very weird that Nick Fury not only hid the harvest in one of his gravestones, but he has several gravestones throughout the world. That is not subtle, not spy-like at all, Nick Fury, so I want to marry his most prized possession to Talos' symbol for his home, symbolizing their friendship and a physical manifestation of Nick Fury's promise to the Skrulls. We cut back to the trio as they're chased by the military and Fury attempts to shoot their tires off. 
Gaia argues with Talos about the murder of her mother. Talos knew all along, and she probes him for answers. He promised himself to never take a scroll life, hence why he did not kill Gravik. He's a defender of his people. He claims, as Nick Fury overhears the conversation between father and daughter, he looks at the pair with suspicion, and Talos confesses what Gravik has been doing. Killing Fake Ross, killing Hill, killing Soren. He's become a radical for Nick Fury's mission, and his belief system rubbed off on the hidden Skrull population. Fury is shaken to the core. Talos suddenly stops the car, and as Fury turns to him, he sees the road ahead, blocked by Skrulls, standing with picket signs and posters and shirts. Trust Nick Fury. What have we done? Talos asks. The military stops behind them and steps out, running towards the Skrulls, who in turn run towards the enemies with guns, knives, tortures, and all kinds of weapons. It is an all-out civil war. The trio step out of the car and try their best to stop the carnage as lives, both human and scroll, are lost around them. They attempt to hold the scrolls back and shoot the military with non-lethal force, but it is too overwhelming. Suddenly, the earth shakes and everyone falls to the ground. Gravik has arrived sporting his super scroll powers and wearing his young Nick Fury skin. He begins to ragefully kill both humans and scrolls as he makes his way to Nick Fury. He reaches Fury and grabs his arm, pulling him up. Fury pushes him away in shock. Help, Talos! We have to stop this! We have to save your people! You're my people, Nick! Gravik shouts back, turning back to the slaughter. Fury goes back to protecting the scrolls until Rhodey comes into the battle and corners him. Fury is unable to move or to shoot back. In the distance, he sees a downed Gaia and Talos attempting to keep the military away, turning back to his natural form in an attempt to frighten them. Behind Talos emerges Nick Fury, who holds a scroll by the neck, choking him out. Talos turns and points his gun before realizing who he is looking back at. He turns to see the real Nick Fury across the highway, but as he turns back, Gravik pierces Talos through the chest with his arm. Talos falls to the ground next to his daughter, with his last lifeless look pointed Fury's way. Fury in shock stares back at Gravik, who himself displays nothing but sadness. As the military begins to close on him, Fury is rescued by a different team of armed military and carried to an armored car, which rushes off the scene as he's thrown in. Sonia is inside, and so is an unconscious Gaia. A right mess you've gotten us all into, Nick. What shall we do about it? And so ends my episode 4. I wanted the middle chapters of my secret invasion to all be about escalation, building up to the point of no return. I essentially split my version of the series into a three-act structure, divided themselves by two episodes in each act. Nick Fury now knows who Gravik is, there's no more trust anymore, and there's a payoff to it all. There are consequences to the actions. And as sad as Talos' death is, I didn't want to deviate from it. I just wanted to make it better. I wanted the relationships building up until that moment to matter more. I also wanted to pile on the consequences of Nick Fury's inaction causing Talos' betrayal without ever getting a chance for a squeaky clean repairing of the friendship. I want the sense of it being too late. I want the sense of what their actions caused to their friendship and now there's no going back. Quite literally, there's a point of no return, which leads us right into the last act of the series, the finale, episodes 5 and 6, so let's go to the penultimate chapter of My Secret Invasion. I titled my episode 5 of Secret Invasion, The Promise. It's the beginning of the climax of this show. We need to have characters realize the consequences of their actions and decision making and how it has affected their lives and the lives of those around them causing the events of this show. So after the Highway Civil War, Sonia takes Fury and Gaia to her new hideout. She has set base where the human bodies replaced by scrolls are located. A location she discovered thanks to her partnership with Gaia. A heavy silence covers the room between the three until Fury attempts to comfort Gaia, who interrupts his condolences by asking to bury her father. It's the least he deserves. Fury looks at Sonia and she confirms they secured the body along with a pair. Fury makes a call, and we don't see to whom, 
but he asks an eye is kept on Gravik and New Scrolls along with gathering footage about his deeds, his murders, the faces he's wearing, and his attack on the highway where he killed both humans and scrolls. Sonia plays a video of the battle showing Gravik's new powers. Fury confesses to the pair the secret collector task force he gathered after the battle for Earth in Endgame to gather samples from the heroes and that Gravik was his general. When Sonia asks why not call his special friends to fight him, Fury rejects this notion, admitting to Sonia and Gaia they, along with Talos, were right. This is his mess and one he needs to clean up himself. It is time to end this, but he needs Sonia's and Gaia's help. Sonia walks out to prepare for her next steps and Gaia asks Fury how long ago he realized he couldn't find the scrolls at home. Fury admits he knew mere months after making the promise, but he always had a distraction. Whether it was the Avengers, the fall down of S.H.I.E.L.D., or even being snapped. And once he ran out of excuses, he simply ran away once more leaving Talos to clean up after him. Gaia readies to confess she took some samples for herself, like Ravik. But Fury interrupts. Talos told him. But he tells Gaia there's a secret sample Gravik does not have. He gives Gaia coordinates asking her to do it only if necessary. Fury stands up and leaves, telling Gaia to go to Vara, as she will know what to do about Talos. Now prepare for the biggest change so far in my secret invasion. We cut to the White House, and the President of the US is angry. Rhodey walks in, and the POTUS demands answers on why Nick Fury is not under arrest yet and to get the illegal scrolls under control, demanding lethal forces used if necessary. Rhodey turns into Gravik in his natural form. Nick Fury and my people will live in fear of you no more. Gravik shoots the president, turns back into Rhodey, and walks out. Sonia arrives at Dr. Dalton's house, and the same scene from the show plays out. But this time, Dalton is taken along with the DNA samples in her possession. From here, we cut to new Skrullos. Gravik arrives, and the mood is somber. No smiles, no happy children no warm welcome. A few scrolls gather to jump Gravik, but they are easily disposed of. Not knocked out, but killed in front of everyone ruthlessly. Gravik exclaims they stand for and with Nick Fury, and should anyone step out of line, the same will happen to them. They should prepare to fight. The arrival of the US military is imminent. Gaia arrives at Vara's house and quickly disposes of Rhodey's task force with her powers not killing them. This gives way to the conversation between the two revolving around Vara having built a life for herself, realizing she did not need to find a new home when she built one with fury on Earth, one filled with light where she is loved. The pair burns Telos's body in ancient scroll tradition. Gaia now understands what her father was fighting for all along. Despite not finding their home, they could build a life on this planet, make best of their circumstances. Fury meets with Gravik in his young Nick Fury form in Brixton. Gravik goes for a hug, but Fury pushes him away. What did you do, kid? I saved you. I made sure anyone who betrayed you didn't get in the way of our new home. Fury makes the same confession he made to Gaia, admitting Talos was right all along. He couldn't see it, and neither does Gravik. Talos' secret wasn't about betrayal, but rather that he managed to succeed where Fury failed. He found Skrulls a life on Earth. Peaceful and full of light, which only made Fury realize his biggest sin was never in failing to find them a home, but rather in making refugees his soldiers, pulling them into wars that were never theirs to battle. This is what was missing in Secret Invasion. The nuance, the commentary about scrolls as refugees is completely lost when they're just made to be the bad guys. This is a cause and effect of what Nick Fury did to the Skrulls. This is his biggest sin. You don't take refugees and make them into spies and soldiers, into an armada to do what you want them to do. This is what Nick Fury needed to realize in Secret Invasion and how everything goes out of control because someone might believe in what he preaches. And we need Nick Fury to be this morally shady guy that comes to this realization he is not the man of integrity his wife sees. Fury apologizes to Gravik, but he steps back. That is not what you promised me, he says. 
Seeing how Talos managed to keep good on his word and simultaneously fulfilled his promise made Nick Fury feel purposeless. But it doesn't have to be the same with Gravik. He can begin anew here. Gravik grabs Fury by the neck with a Groot arm. Gravik's voice shakes with overwhelming sadness. I believed in you. I killed my people for you. He throws Fury to the ground and walks away. Fury struggles to get up and receives a text from Rhodey telling him to turn on the news. The President of the United States has been murdered. The Scrolls are the lead suspects and a new President, ready to take action against the unwanted visitors, has now been elected. President Thunderbolt Ross. And we managed to finish the first half of the finale with a massive cliffhanger that has consequences for the show, consequences for the wider MCU, and raises a whole new version of stakes for this show. I'm not going to waste too much more of your time. Let's get to my finale of Secret Invasion. It is time for my finale of Secret Invasion, the episode where every storyline and every character arc have to converge, meeting a resolution that is equivalent for every important character involved. And we begin the same way as the finale of the show did, with Nick Fury calling Vara, seeking comfort. In my version of this opening, he recites the poem from episode 4, inquiring if she has felt loved. Vara openly confesses, yes, reassuring him he doesn't need to go if he doesn't want to. Fury hangs up and makes another call, saying the time has come and all stations need to be ready. We cut to President Ross aboard Air Force One, surrounded by aerial forces on their way to Chernobyl, where Gravik stands with Skrull radicals at the ready. But many of the innocent Skrull refugees stand inside the buildings, looking out through the windows as the planes approach preparing for the inevitable horror that is coming their way. The troops touch the ground and begin formation, lining up tanks, cannons, and countless soldiers with guns pointed the scrolls' way. Ross steps out and speaks through a microphone. They are ready for the scrolls to surrender. Before Gravik can reply, from the other end of the compound, he gets information that the Russian military is approaching. The scrolls stand defenseless between the two national forces. Gravik begins to step forward as his body morphs into several superheroes' body parts. But a light shines down from the sky. Nick Fury descends alongside Rhodey in his war machine armor and Saber made up of humans, scrolls, and other alien species alike, outnumbering both the Russian and US militaries. Because remember how Nick Fury has an entire military operation up there and never once in this show uses it? I thought it was a wasted opportunity. So here it is. A force field is created around the buildings of Chernobyl, and Fury's troops immediately knock the scroll radicals unconscious and rush to the inside to get the refugees away. Ross is speechless and his armed forces powerless against Saber's alien technology and advanced weaponry, as is the Russian military. Gravik is stunned. He was not prepared for this. Consumed by anger, he unleashes his super scroll form and runs towards Nick Fury, but is knocked down away from him. And as Gravik stands back up from the rubble, we see Gaia, now with Captain Marvel powers, but also the powers of Hulk, Thor, and even Thanos himself. Powers Gravik does not possess. I not only like this fight in terms of the action, clearly Dragon Ball inspired, but I also like it thematically. We need to get Gaia to get revenge for her mother and her father. So if you thought I would take this fight out because it's lame, well, my argument is... No, that's just awesome. <laughs> From here, Gaia vs. Gravik plays out the same as in this show. Intercut with Nick Fury alongside Saber, not only rescuing the refugees, but also the humans that have been replaced by Skrulls. But Gaia ends up killing Gravik over the flower orchard, baiting the Skrull flowers with his harvest blood. And the flowers begin to bloom symbolizing the scrolls can now thrive on Earth. As the last of the refugees are taken up to the Saber Station, Fury steps up to Ross, the military at the ready behind him. You continue to be my biggest headache, Ross says. Oh, I'm not done yet, Fury retorts. The scrolls are under my protection, but I assure you, they won't bother you or Russia anymore. You have room for them all up there? Ross asks, looking up. What? 
Hell no, that's just their transport. I'm keeping my promise of finding them a home here, place where you have no jurisdiction so they can finally integrate themselves as a fellow nation of Earth. Ross is speechless. What have you done, Fury? Fury just smiles and goes up to the ship. We cut to the island of Tiamut, now the new home of the Skrulls on Earth, where they can all start anew as a society. The powerful Gaia now stands as their leader and protector, their own Avenger. She stands being adored by the saved refugee crowds and receives a call from Sonia. Don't run into any trouble, but I owe Fury, so if you do, call me. And she now sits in her new office as the head of the SIS. We cut to Fury driving passenger in a car driven by Rhodey. Fury thanks him for his help, and Rhodey claims it wasn't easy, making Fury look like a fool always getting caught in trouble. It's very off-brand for him. Fury laughs. So Rhodey is not a scroll in my version. He never was. He has always secretly been Fury's eyes on Earth, which is why his powerful position within the government is important. His mission in my secret invasion was to make sure Fury was constantly suspect number one, so eyes would be averted from scrolls, including Gravik, as much as possible. Rhodey leaves Fury at his house, where he goes to say goodbye to Vara, apologizing for leaving so often, which she understands only means he must do it again. When Fury asks for her to come, she says now more than ever, her people need her here. Fury understands and leaves with the same words as in the show. If you can find a way to forgive me, you know where to find me. As he readies to go up to Saber, Vara arrives in her car and asks, what's his excuse this time? Fury says with the scroll troubles down here, the Kree Empire has found new reason to see them as a threat and is strategizing the best way to come to Earth and deal with the issue. But if Fury had a scroll beside him to speak for the species, Vara agrees to go in attempts to begin a peace agreement. But this is still his mess to clean up. They exchange the same loving words and a kiss before going up, and we cut to black. And so ends my version of Secret Invasion. And like I said at the beginning of this video, I didn't want to change the show drastically and essentially have the same show we did get, but what I find to be a better version that fixes a ton of the issues in my opinion. Obviously, hindsight is 2020. I have the privilege of not knowing the MCU's plan, so I have the freedom to connect or not connect in any way I see fit. I also have an imaginary, unlimited budget and resources for this show, but I find that integrating more cloak and dagger political overtones and undertones to this show, as well as feed more into the characterization of how flawed Nick Fury is, and really make a show about his decision making for the past 30 years, speaks truer to who his character is throughout the MCU more than ever. This is a man whose secrets have secrets. But don't let me speak for myself. Start a conversation with your thoughts, your criticisms of my rewrite of Secret Invasion, your thoughts on the Secret Invasion we did get, and what would you have done to fix the show we got. And let me know if you like videos like this and want to see more videos like it. I had a ton of fun doing this and would love to do more stuff like this. Secret Invasion is, while not the worst MCU project ever, is to me by far the most disappointing. I've never been so heartbroken by anything the MCU has done as I am with this show. So I couldn't just give you a standard review. I wanted to put my money where my mouth is, and hopefully I've done that for all of you. And speaking of, I'm giving Marvel Secret Invasion a C+. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to start a conversation with your thoughts on Marvel Secret Invasion my secret invasion and let me know if you want to see more videos like this big shout out to my channel members for always supporting the channel and i'll be back very soon with more videos so until the next one love each other and love the movies